welcome to the other side where we take a ride each week and discuss our guest's personal journey, their hard work, sacrifice, struggles and failures, along with their passion, dedication, and determination. This is The Other Side. Welcome everybody, this is The Other Side, and today we have a very special guest. I'm very excited to meet him and get to know him. Uh, just, you know, I'm a, we're big music fans, and uh, the gentleman in front of me is uh, something special. What's going on, Chris? Hey, I'm excited. Marcos, thank you for coming in. I re really appreciate your time, and, uh, and, and uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, you know what? Thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be here, and uh, let's see what we can talk about. <laughs> let's get to it. Marcos Curiel. Yep, you got it right. Damn, there you Curiel. Go. Curiel. Hey, man, thanks for being here. What, what, where, where, where do you start? Like, when do you pick a, an instrument? What was guitar your first love, or did you start playing something else? Well, I grew up in the neighborhood. Uh, this was, we're going to go way back when I was living in a little place called Logan Heights off of National Avenue. Really? Barrio Logan over Barrio here. Barrio Logan. Nice. And my mom was still living with her parents, and she bought a piano because she's like, you guys are going to learn how to play the piano. I didn't really take interest in it, but one day I just sat down and started fiddling around with the notes, and I wrote a, a song. And my grandfather has the musical blood, the musical bone. He was a mariachi. He played, I always heard he played for President Roosevelt and all this stuff, right? So he comes running into the room and he's like, in, this, in Spanish, ¿Quién te enseñó esa, esa canción? Who, who taught you that song? Right. And uh, I was like, nobody, nadie. And he was like, what? And I go, that's my song. And he was so ec ecstatic. He was like, this grandchild of mine has it. He had no lessons. He wrote a song on his own by sitting at the piano and nobody taught him nothing. That's when I kind of knew, like, just it just came out of me. And uh, that was early on. I was probably like around, because he passed away when I was 10. So it was probably like eight, maybe seven years old. Wow. I picked up guitar. Uh, like, my mom bought me a guitar when I was 13 for my birthday. And it wasn't because of a trend or my friends were all starting a band. I was in the neighborhood still. So growing up, you know, everyone's listening to, you know, breakdance music and oldies. And so when they found out that, that, that I liked that kind of music, a lot of my friends would tease me. Oh, man, that's, that's that white boy music, bro. You like that white boy. That's that devil music. La musica del diablo. The devil stuff, right? And so, so um, you know, I asked for one. And my mom's like, what? Why do you want to play guitar for? And I was like, why not? And uh, this was after, obviously, rest in peace, my grandfather passed away. And I was like, I don't know. I just want to play guitar. I saw a commercial for Monsters of Rock nice. in the stadium. And I think yes, it was sir. like Scorpions. And, mm -hmm. and I forget who else. And one of the guys did like a knee slide on the stage with the guitar. And he was just wailing on a solo. And I was like, <laughs> that's what I want to do with my life. But before that, I wanted to be a pilot. So my family was all like kind of bummed because they're, this is going to be like the first kid that goes to college and <laughs> and goes and becomes a pilot and all this stuff and i was like it switched it was like yo i want to play guitar i want to be a rock star <laughs> <laughs> and you know what i i, I kind of did it man so hey hey uh, what do you mean kind of well you know what it, i mean like, absolutely but do you said so many things first of all there's something to be said there for you know what's in our genes you know like uh and i'm, I'm and and i'm glad that you're grandpa i mean the sucks that passed away when you were so young but i'm glad that he actually s saw you heard you and got a little like excited yeah. about the fact that like oh sh you know my jeans that, are man. right there bro yeah. that, that. and so there's something to be said for that for sure because i know like uh for instance i had one of my godsons he's a very talented he's always been ta but this is a little kid yeah according but he, he plays everything a little bit of everything but self-taught mm -hmm. you know and and, and you're like we were blown away. Like, yeah, he's playing the accordion. Yeah. I said, bro. So it's it's amazing how that happens. And uh, But the other point, very important point, like in your life, uh, you know, from pilot to this, but for you to realize, like, this is, this is what I want to it, do. It's unexplainable. Like, when I see kids today, even with my own children, like, they don't have that. Like, ah, oh, oh, whatever. I've tried to leave, not force them, but leave guitars around. I got you a guitar. They don't take up to it. So... I'm hoping that what my grandfather felt, maybe it's not with my kids, maybe it's with the grandchild. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be like, oh, my 
my gosh. You know what I mean? <laughs> but who knows? Um, I, I, you know, it's something that just kind of clicks and then it instantly, your passion and your, and your love and dedication goes to it. And, you know, my grandfather, my grandma was with my grandfather and for many years. And she said, mijo, if you pick this lifestyle, I'm going to tell you it's amazing, but it's also very hard very to try hard. to keep, you're going to have to find a female partner that's going to understand what it is you do because she's going to have to be strong, grounded, and understand that you, like she's all with your tata, I knew he came home to me, that was my man, I loved him, we had children, we, and that was it. Oh, but there's girls out there, she, she was explaining to me, right, right, right. it can either be a very, it's going to be a fun life, but she's like, it could be very lonely because, you know, because of that, because of that. And, and I, I've been divorced, I have two kids from two different females, well, thank God, <laughs> <laughs> hey now, hey, now, hey, hey, I'm glad you clarified that. Bro. <laughs> no, but um, so it it's got its ups and downs, just like anything, dude. Not, not not to mention the fact that the career itself is so hard. Mm, I'm surprised dude, we've been doing it as long as we have, dude. That it, there's a lot to be said for for the amount of years you guys have been doing it mm. because just that to be a musician is really really hard let alone the personal side of it mm -hmm. you know just just it's, it's it's amazing first of all you gotta have the talent mm -hmm. and then you gotta have, count on all these other outside factors you know labels and this and that. all these things need to kind of fall into place for to have some type of success it's hard. there's so many talented people out there that never see the light yeah. of day you know it is it's just like um it's we're, we as a band we talk about it every day man well, you know we also say like we spend more time with each other as a family than we do with our own personal families because we're constantly touring the world. We made a conscious decision when we got our first big record deal with Atlantic Records, then we weren't just gonna be an American band, like in the States. We were gonna go to Latin America, we were gonna go to Europe, we were gonna go to Asia, and we were gonna try to dominate the world. Right. And that paid off because when things cool down in certain markets, other markets are still available. And you just you made yourself a worldwide income, not just one. You don't just have one country. You got all of them <laughs> per se. You know what I'm saying? So we're blessed in that sense. But that's definitely a business, man. Absolutely. So you ask your mom for a guitar. She gets it to you, and then you you just start practicing. And I'm self taught. How do you self taught. I I got some pointers along the way, but yeah, I remember thinking when I got my guitar, my amp, that I was gonna be like shred and, and like going off right nah i got a reality check real quick i got <laughs> got into my room and i was like okay how do you tune this thing <laughs> yeah. and then back then there was no internet so I would, you had to buy dude, magazines and be like i was just gonna tell you that like kids nowadays man you just pop in on youtube yeah. how do you do this how do you do that that's exactly something. back in the day bro you, you no you had nothing. magazines yeah. that mean for me it was magazine and then going to concerts like there was a big punk rock scene straight edge scene i don't know if you're familiar with what that is but It's part of a punk rock hardcore scene. And that scene, you'd go to shows and watch guys play at the garage and everybody'd be going crazy. But then I'd be staring at the guitar players and be going, yo, I'm gonna try that when I get home. And I couldn't wait to get home just to try to get replicate certain sounds. And uh, that's how I learned, man. Really? And you know, I had friends that gave me pointers and we would jam, hey man, you gotta try this and try that. But I never had like a teacher sit with me, teach me theory and all of that. So everything, Uh, I was just talking to a, with a friend of mine. She was like, so what's up? Kind of the same question. I go, well, I'm a I'm, um, musico de la, de, la, de la calle. I'm a street musician. You know what I mean? So yeah. I taught myself, and, and uh, I'm, that's why I think part of my sound is very unorthodox. You know, a lot of people are like, well, what made you think of those notes? I'm like, just felt good. And that's, there's something to be said for that, because like uh, you actually mentioned it earlier before we started this thing, that, Once it's uh, too structured and scripted, and then it's not rock and roll no more. Yeah, if it's too clean. But you know what? I think right now that's we're kind of in this weird place because pop is overtaking everything. Mm -hmm. It's overtaking country. It's overtaking everything. And and I think I believe 
that things will balance each themselves. They out. always, it always do, comes bro. Comes back around. They always do. They, they, oh. I remember before. I'm a big uh, Guns and Roses fan, mm. and uh, before that, like uh, the, the the hair bands, and they were yeah. basically cookie cutters. You know, every every uh, LP had uh, so many songs, and oh, you got to throw in your your melody there, here yeah. and there. You know, everybody with their, and then uh, then Guns and Roses showed up, and it was like rock and roll, bro. This is how yeah. it is. This is uh, you know, no bones about it, and just kind of mad, pissed off, and 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 it was great. Um, and then, you know, when Nirvana came out, it yeah. was a different type. So it always, but I, I see what you're saying. It, you know, kind of people goes this way, but yeah, it always it, comes back. It's weird, man. Like I, I'll, I'll discover a new young band and I'm like, yes, this is giving me hope. Right. I'm like, I love what these kids are doing, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, dude. Hey, so when you start playing, cause I mean, that's the other thing with guitar playing, uh, cause I, I wish I could. I knew how to play, and I and I've tried it a couple of times. But the other thing is, bro, your your fingers hurt, mm-hmm. you know, especially at first. Well, it's funny because recently I had to start rehearsing for something, and uh, I hadn't played that much and consistent in a long time because of the pandemic. Right, my fingers were killing me. Dude. <laughs> really? I was like, oh my gosh, man, I forgot, and now my calluses are built back up again. But dude, you don't realize when they're not there, you're like, it's like razor blades just going up and down you're like ah we need a break man my fingers are dying <laughs> <laughs> so back in the day what's uh what's the first song you uh, you learned that you Ooh, said uh, i would say the first song i the two first songs you're gonna laugh was black sabbath's iron man of course and uh scorpions uh rock you like a hurricane <laughs> those power hey, chords man dude Damn. Scorpions is uh, I love Scorpions, man. Yeah. I was they, yeah. they had great, great songs. Heck I they yeah, still, dude. The, the, the way they wrote and stuff. I mean, and, and then the singer's voice was just iconic, dude. We were just talking about this on this other podcast I was on. What's your favorite Scorpion song? And I was like, "Still loving you, dude." Still loving you is a great dude, song. It's a beautiful song. Oh, I beautiful. can listen to this. It's like, damn, I love this song. Yeah, you know what? And yeah, we talked about this all the time. You like like certain certain songs, certain uh, music smell or taste you know they take you back bro yeah, yeah. You, you you could have burnt it out like this goes with zeppelin this goes with you too a lot of these iconic bands and bob marley oh, yeah. i haven't heard in a while and then you pop it in it's like oh my gosh takes you back to that spot right? it takes you back to that spot but then you're almost like this is amazing it never yeah. fades like yeah. damn this now I, it's just you, what, there's no words man it's right. priceless it's amazing Dude, let's uh, you said Led Zeppelin. Uh, a lot of people that start playing guitar like Stairway to Heaven is a is a go to, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, that was in Wayne Wayne's World. No Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we're dating those, yourself. We're but, dating ourselves with yeah, Wayne's World. On it. <laughs> yeah, but check this out, man. That's what's lacking in music. I think a lot is like those types of bands made you want to play guitar, made you want to play drums. When you heard Rush, you were like, dude, I want to be a drummer. An instrument, period, yeah, right? Yeah, you're like, when you heard Zeppelin or Hendrix, you're like, dude, I want to play guitar. Correct. You know, you listen to like reggae or some funk, you're like, dude, I want to play bass. What, what were some of your big punk influences? Oh, dude, Bad Brains. Oh, yeah, I saw them at Wallbash. Hey, oh, I was going to say, yeah, bro. Yeah, dude. back in 86. Dude, we were, we were honored and, and blessed to have HR, the singer of Bad Brains, on a song with us and and something that we try to do on, on every record is we get like um it wasn't too popular in rock or punk but we were taking that hip-hop mentality where you get like guest appearances from other bands yeah right we didn't care people are like what are you guys doing but well, we come from that whole vibe from the streets we like collabs now more rock bands are doing it but back then we got hr we got eka mouse we've had uh, the singer from helmet uh, the singer from awesome. sick of it all lou We've had all these different iconic, uh, Mike from Suicidal Tendencies. We've had them all Suicidal different albums. Suicidal Tendencies, that's going back. And we, we do it even though, to us, they're legendary and iconic, but a lot of the kids that listen to us don't know nothing about them. Nothing. So then we're like, we're introducing you guys to some legendary yeah. stuff right here. You said you said Helmet. I mean, they were right on the edge, and they did it just not happen? Oh, well, you know what? I mean, everyone that knows that New York post-hardcore like vibe and energy, like, you know who Helmet is. They're so tight. I mean, they, they never, so I don't think they ever got that mainstream major success, but they did that one album, Meantime, was about their, that was the height of that. Yeah, for sure. You know, then another thing that for me, 
uh, it was funny because we talked about this uh, on other shows. Like, <laughs> you know, when I was like 12, you know, I was listening to Molly Crew. And, you know, like every generation, usually the parents or the your, your elders start saying, oh, man, that, that, what, what are you listening to? <laughs> exactly. You know, it happened in the 70s, you know, with Led Zeppelin and whatnot. But like with me, it was Molly Crew. And then so I all of a sudden I come home and I, I'm, I'm shouting at the devil, you know, and then yeah. my dad's like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. But that or Dio's Holy Diver. Oh, Dio, bro, the last yeah. in line, uh, <laughs> Rainbow in record. the Dark. Oh, my mom saw that 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 cover. And she was like, <laughs> "What is this? With the priests in the water, with the devil with chains around?" Him. I was like, "Dude, it's amazing, mom. Dude, Just trust me, it's not like what look. a voice for such a little guy, dude. Yeah, the little he had wizard. Some, yeah, some pipes, man. Yeah, dude. But I was gonna say, uh, for instance, uh, especially when when Guns N' Roses came, uh, the the music video when MTV was MTV, right? Mm-hmm. When actually music videos, <laughs> not what it is right now, but yeah, no idea. when they used to play videos, play, right? Yeah, right. Um, but uh, Paradise City, uh, yeah. the power of, and it's basically, uh, you know, your your vocalist Axl Rose and and uh, your bassist, your drummer, yeah, your guitarist, yeah. Um, but to me, like that video shows like the the, the power of a band and the power of a front man mm-hmm. when you have you can make a whole stadium jump up and, up and oh, down. Yeah. It's, it's it's there's there's something so special about them and it's awesome. Well, Guns and Roses, I, I saw them on their reunion. Uh, tour a few years back um, I saw them at Dodger Stadium and then I saw them here at uh, Qualcomm wow and one of the funniest things because you know when Axel throws his mic out at the end of the show <laughs> yeah. we saw this dude I, I, I got you know complimentary nine ninth rope and whatever passes tickets. right and this at the end of the show he's like ah! he throws his mic I see this guy run like 10 yards to dive for the freaking mic, flip over some chairs. <laughs> I could not stop laughing, dude. And then he's on the ground. He like, he caught the football, but it was, yeah, the yeah, it was good. <laughs> and everybody was clapping. Yeah. <laughs> when you were describing it, I was like, that's like a football player going after the dude, ball. It was <laughs> so hilarious. I, I think I remember that more than the show itself. <laughs> I was like, that was amazing. I got so lucky back. Uh, uh, shit, and this is about four years ago. Uh, my daughter was going off to college and I decided to, to spend three days with her at Coachella. Oh, but you know how they do their thing? Like that, you you just buy the tickets and you don't know who who's headlining. Yeah. And so I bought them in June because she was gonna go the the following year. And then in January they announced their reunion in Coachella. Dude, that oh. was right there. And to me, I was in heaven. It, it was funny because it it was a kind of like a present for her, and mm-hmm. and, and it ended up being a better hey. bigger deal for me. Hey, that's Guns N' Roses saying, "Hey, we're glad you and your lady made a baby." And you know what? And, and, and now you're with your, your daughter at the concert, and you're reaping the benefits too, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but it's awesome. Well, let me ask you about that, man. Like, for you, what is it, what is it like to be up on a stage and, and to, you know, be playing your guitar and, and watching all these people react to your notes? You know what? A perfect example, I think one of the most powerful songs in our arsenal is Youth of the Nation. Right. Um, and when you hear that first note, and there's a whole backstory on how that song got written, but when you hear that first note, it doesn't matter if you're in China, Japan, and they don't even speak the language. As soon as people hear that first ding, 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 you're like, ah, like it doesn't matter, dude. Like yeah. it just breaks down barriers culturally, everything, dude, and it just connects. And it's such a beautiful thing. It's one of the funnest, uh, one of our biggest songs for me, just to get out and strum a note it's one of my favorites because of that reason and that song has a serious background because we were subleasing like renting a spot to write the new satellite the record satellite at that time the label was paying and we needed to find a spot where we could rehearse throughout the day and not get people complaining Mm. so we found this spot that was kind of behind 7-eleven on prospect in cuyamaca i know where that is yeah dude and there's like a Hilberto's taco shop, but behind it, there was this little warehouse thing and we were jamming there. Well, we would get, we, we're, we're not a normal band. We would go like if it was our job with coffee in the morning and we'd start writing at like nine and go till about two. Really? Every day. During the day? That's unusual. Because that was our job. Yeah. And one morning on our way there, I was living in East Lake at the time. It was weird, helicopters flying around cars zooming fast on the freeway and i was like what is going on come to find out this kid did a uh, you know a mass shooting uh, at santana high oh, yeah. 
And uh, we were like, what is going on? And it's crazy because we say that that song is more relevant now today mm. because of the topic You're right? than it was then. But that song was born that day. We were so bummed out. We're like, man, somebody's kids lost their lives today. And the parents just kissed them goodbye to go to school. And I go, that's just awful. And that note, ding, ding, we started jamming. And this song was born that day. Mm. Of that, a, of that freaking tragedy that's so, a trip man yeah, dude. But it, and it goes to show you like you never know and how one thing triggers another like if if you didn't see all the, the sirens and the cops and all that the helicopters that song would have never existed well the pro skater at the th back in the day steve stedham he was like one of the first like mm -hmm. african-american sticky skaters mm -hmm. he was subleasing his studio out to us i was i didn't really know who he was at the time but he had a TV on in his in the console room up in the corner, and it was showing all the news. So we knew right then, like, we, what, what's going on, man? And we saw it, and we were like, what? School shooting. And then we went into the to the room and started jamming. Wow. That is, that's, uh, like I said, man, it's amazing, because that song took you guys all over the world. It was, and that, you know what's weird? That song didn't get to number one either. It got to number six. Mm. I didn't know that. And that's know our that biggest song. Because it was, yeah, it was huge. It's yeah. weird, man. Like, the industry is such a weird place. We have songs after the fact that got to number one that are not as big as that song, even though that song, it's just timing, dude. That song was number six. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's pretty weird. Yeah. How, how that all works out. But that song, it, got, it was top ten, but it wasn't number one. But I think that song, more than anything, introduce yourselves to like a bigger way bigger audience yes. you know and since uh, that's another thing that happens like once people know about you then the next thing you come out they're more prone to make it a number one hit exactly you, you know what and, and just since we're going to touch on that subject satellite uh 2021 is the 20th year anniversary of that album yeah wow. showing my age bro, yeah, but fuck. check this you out man hey, thanks for bringing me yeah, down bro <laughs> no, but, but dude, <laughs> How many bands can still say that they're mm. doing it from a certain era and have the same four original band members? That's not too many. And we're like the true definition of an American dream rock and roll band. Down in uh, Del Sol, we started in a garage. Del Sol, Ch right by the DMV over there? Over there, over kind of, well, kind of by uh, Montgomery High School. And we, we started in our drummer's garage, and that's where we started rehearsing. And that's where the band was born. And then we just started playing parties in Bonita, keggers around town. Then we started playing the first Soma downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got 100 people to get our, and say our name. And then we went to the main stage and we opened for Green Day twice. Wow. And we were at the actual show where Green Day got signed to Warner Brothers before Dookie came out. And Dookie was their big introduction album to the public. Damn, man. No, but I, I mean, it, it, it sounds great but it does it didn't happen quite like that and quite that fast did it not for us right because of our spiritual overtones as a band mm -hmm. the guy that signed green day told our manager at the time i love pod they're different but i don't understand the lyrics wow and if we would and, and that meant there's no sales yeah to him right? he didn't get it so right. If we would have got signed then, things could have even been way different. That would have mm. been before Rage. Wow. You know, and think about that. Shh. But we just kept doing it independently. We got signed in 97. So probably, what, four years later, maybe five years later. But the, but even then, like, uh, that's why I tell people all the time, like, uh, you know, they use, not all of a sudden you see POD and they're all over the place and... But they don't understand. You guys were grinding and you were doing your thing. And uh, like you said, you're starting out a garage. And, um, and we did a van. And my family was like, mijo, mom, mom. She was like, where are you going? And school's out. We're going on tour for three, four weeks. In a van with a trailer? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Selling CDs the hard gangster way. Dude. Oh, yeah. That's how you do it, man. Hey, that Dr. Dre and all those. They, they, that's how they did it? You know what, dude? And that's what got us these labels to notice. They're like, if these guys sold 50,000 CDs... From just doing that, what happens if somebody puts a little muscle behind them? Right. And even then, with the first record, Atlantic Sinus, you still have to make that big machine work in your favor. We still did it the hard way. We made relationships with MTV before radio was playing us. So MTV started to play us, and there was a show called TRL, mm. where 
our fans were calling in and they were making us known. Yeah, like, uh, well, but that's another part of the game. Like, uh, who, it's not like that anymore. Who, but who, back, back in the day with the, dealing with the label and the marketing and all that, who, who taught you guys? Who, who or was it just instinct? Because, I mean, no. you know, you, you hear, especially with rock bands, horror stories of how they, they were taken advantage of. I mean, nothing was perfect, but our drummer's dad actually got us our start. Mm. He believed in his son and his son's band, and he actually put his own money down mm. to help us record albums. I mean, way overpriced back then, because now you can record a record in somebody's Shit, on laptop. And yeah. So back then, we were going into Signature Sound. I don't know if you know that big studio uh, up in uh, off of Claremont Mesa Boulevard with Luis. Mm, and, yeah. Yeah, and they we were going there, but dude, I mean, it was like expensive. Not like LA studios, but it was still like seven, eight hundred dollars a day for a band like us. Got no money, right? We were able to go under this record company with his dad, with the drummer's dad, and that was where we got our start. And if it wasn't for that kind of support, I don't know where we would have been. I mean, maybe if it wasn't the start, somebody else would have came in. Who knows? But at that point, like, forever grateful for that. His name was Noah, Noah Bernardo. That is Wolf's dad, and then. We parted ways, and he was our manager, too. And he was like, look, I want you guys to take it to the next level. I found this other guy that could take you guys there management-wise. Really? Yeah. Wow, man, that's that's uh, that's pretty amazing about, on his part. Because, I mean, he could have felt like, hey, man, I helped build this stuff. Now, you know, I mean, there's why still, is somebody going to take over? I mean, come on. We give him credit for that all the time, and there's still some of that. But it's one of those things where... You know, you got to accept, like, hey, man, it's time to go to the next level. This right. is the next person to take you there. So Right. No, but I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, there, you know how it is, bro. There's a lot of people that don't, don't they don't show that humility. <laughs> they don't want to let go. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, no, you're right. And, and there was a little bit of that, but it wasn't, it was all good. It was all good. And, you know, but obviously with his son being part of the band, that's a, that was huge, I would think, like for him. And seeing you guys hustle and seeing you treated as a, job you know you you were you weren't just like uh you know messing uh, it's kind of like a hobby if it happens it happens and you you guys were serious about it dude we had to make a conscious decision where we all said we all got to quit our jobs holy and i had to drop out of college and i was like oh you going to school i was going to city and i was i don't know what my major was but my english professor i go hey man is there any way i can get like my work for three weeks <laughs> and he goes can i talk to you after class and i said sure don't ever tell your parents I said this, but if I had the opportunity that you have, you, he's all, it's highly unlikely that you'll return, but you can always come back to college. You have an opportunity right now. If I had your opportunity at your age, I would take it. But wow. that means I can't, give you your, I can't give you your home, your work beforehand, so you're going to have to drop out. Don't tell your parents I said that. So I can't give you work, but that's my advice. So I dropped out, and I went on tour, and I never went back to college, which... <laughs> You know, I can still go at, at my age. But, Absolutely. So yeah. he, he was right about that, but that was some advice there that was like, okay. And then I quit my job, and we we're like, dude, I don't know how I'm going to pay my my bills. <laughs> but And it was struggling that time. But if we didn't see promise, when we toured, I remember going to a place, middle of Midwest, and 20 people there. We went back, there was 200 people there. Mm. And we went back, and then it was like 500, 1,000. And we were like, for an independent band, that not that's from San Diego going around the country getting those kind of results. We knew we were onto something. That's right. And then when we were selling merchandise, it was just like, dude, we sold out again. And we, but then we and that's a that's a big part of the business, especially back then, right? Well, because it is now too, because there's no CD sales, man. Right. It's all streaming. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah, man, you get you you show you had you were kind of like at least there were signs that you were on on the right path, but. Cause it's it's nerve wracking, man. Just quit your job and oh, and, and everybody's got a dream and every but but it's it's real life, you know. It's, it's a leap you, of faith, right? Oh, it's, dude. There's sometimes we were stranded on the road. Our engine blew out. Yeah. And we're like, dude, how the hell are we gonna get? Here? And somehow, somewhere, all praise to Jah, we were like, dude, we got some money to fix this thing, dude. That's <laughs> right, right? You know, right. it worked out. Yeah. That wow. str that struggle for you, like uh, at a, at a early part in your early time in your career, like it uh, to take us through that just a little bit. Like it's it's you made that decision, you got on the road, you started producing. How does it? How does it? it how did the industry te 
react to you guys. Like you said, like they started well, seeing that you guys were selling CDs and it, merch. And it wasn't the industry; it was a particular guy who signed us to Atlantic Records. His name is John Rubley. Okay, and uh, he got some 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 pushback from his superiors. And I'll never forget this story. We we played for his superiors, like his boss and everybody from Atlantic, at the at the Whiskey A Go Go. Mm-hmm. It wasn't our best show, and he was outside talking to his boss, and I happened to hear it. I was walking around the corner, and they were kind of having a heated little discussion, and he told him, you said you're a wild card band. You really think that this band can do it? It's your effing neck if this doesn't happen. He goes, you want to risk it? Take it. Next thing we know, I walked over and told the guy, dude, I just heard some crazy. And, and I told John that. I said, dude, I heard that. And he's like, trippy. He goes, you see, I went to bat for you guys, right? And I'm all, dude, that's weird. I got, I don't know it was meant for me to hear that, but I overheard it. It was just you two, and I overheard everything by, by chance. It wasn't like I was trying to spy. And um, next thing we know, the, the guy didn't know, the, the head guy didn't know that I had heard that. So, hey, man, congratulations. Welcome to Atlantic Records. He shook our hands, took us to dinner, and I knew the whole time after hearing that he was not. He was not feeling it. completely on board with you. Then. Yeah, but. When that son, when the fundamental elements of Southtown came out, and we had no radio, and we were doing stuff organically, and our fans were getting us on MTV, and it sold a million records, with not too much of a push. Right. And Corn took us to Europe for the first time, and none of our CDs. People were like, "We can't get your CDs in Europe," so we weren't getting that push. Wow. And we were getting that kind of love. It was organic. The next record, he was like, "Dude, this is my band." Ah. <laughs> he, he, he was hanging. He was hanging the POD uh, million uh, platinum record behind his desk. This is that's one of my signings right here. Wow! You see, yeah, and no, the industry yeah. can be weird like that. And we, you know, we, and we know we didn't hate. We were like, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna play we're gonna play the poker game. Yes, and sir. Like, All right. What's up, dude? Thank you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go! Great job. Awesome. Man. <laughs> and then we felt the power. This is a side note. Roger Ames was the head of Warner. We uh. Warner Electra Atlantic. He asked for a favor, <clears throat> and he said, "I have this little band that nobody wants to take on tour. I don't care if you give them twenty minutes. Take them on tour. I promise you guys on the next record, which was Satellite, you guys will be number one priority worldwide." So we didn't know if it was going to happen or not, but we said, "Sure. What do we got? Twenty minutes set. We had already three bands. It's going to be the fourth band. That band was called Lincoln Park." Wow! Wow! And they did blow up, and we started noticing when they were opening the opening band that kids were just like showing, like, man, who are these kids? And like, people, we became friends, and rest in peace. Chester was one of our good friends, and um, yeah, man, uh, it's weird how life works, dude, because uh, really weird. The machine started to work in our favor, but we also had the songs. Oh, we also absolutely. Had everything. You had the goods. Just, everything just lined up for that next record, and Satellite went on to sell like Shh. 5 million, 6 million plus worldwide. So. Damn, man. Now, let, uh, take me to the first time you went to Europe. Oh. Uh, was that because of uh, corn? Corn, but you know, before, like personally, you've never been over there? Never. And so, how does that, like, do you ever, like, uh, during the plane ride, are you, are you like, shit, man, I'm going to Europe because of all this? Well, dude. Yeah, long. I mean, going out of the country and take you know flying those hours. I mean, I'm used to it now, but back then I was like, "What the hell? This is exciting, but I'm scared." Mm. <laughs> you know, we all were like, "What? <laughs> Twenty hour flight? You know, it's five from here to there, and then right. connection to this, and then you finally get to your destiny." We were excited. We were just like, "Let's live it up." We get there, and Corn was just gentlemen, man. They were really cool, man. They they were like, "We love you." South Town had just come out, and uh, that's about South San Diego, and that that was the song that they fell in love with, and they were like, "Dude, let's take those guys on tour with us," and it was just us and Corn, mm. and then same kind of thing happened in Mexico City. We played Stadio Azteca. Wow, dude, that place can put like one hundred twenty thousand yeah. people in there. Yeah, man, the biggest show I think we've ever played, and it was the Chili Peppers who invited us, and it was just us and the Chili Peppers. Wow, wow what a combo, Crazy, man. man. And, you know, that's how it works. Bands are like, dude, we want this band. You know? do, you, do you think that happens uh, 
nowadays, like back in the day, it was like a brotherhood, and and, and people kind of reached out, and then they see whatever, and then say, oh, you know, invite people. Well, I mean, don't get it wrong; it's it's a business. If mm. they know that somebody's hot, it's right. going to benefit their little, show too. Little boost, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, and for the, that band, it's like, oh shit, dude, it's the it's the chili peppers. Yeah, it's corn. You know what I mean? And that was the corn issues tour. Yeah, and we were doing the Chili Pepper show when they were doing Cal- they were on Californication. Oh wow, yeah, dude, big deal. That was a fun trip, I bet. Oh, dude, it was. Aw- we were just talking about that. You go to shows, and then you just never know who's gonna come, and you'll be jamming, and you'll turn to the right, and there's so and so watching your set, and you're like, what? And since we were talking about Guns N' Roses, right? We played Weenie Roast. And I remember I was jamming, and I look over, and I see the top hat, Slash. And Slash is just sitting there chilling, watching us. And I'm like, what? And I turn around, I was like, yeah, dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he was really cool. He's like, dude, I really like what you guys do, man. Really? And I was like, cool, man. Thank you. Hey, remember back in the day uh, when uh, we had street scene here in San Diego? Yeah. Dude, I love that. I used to, at the time, I was working for Time, uh, time Warner, and we used to cover, do it like kind of behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually met uh, Slash, and it's to me, it was like kind of one of the few times that I was like, my mind was blown. Cause like, dude, I mean, I grew up idolizing the guy, right? Mm-hmm. To this day. But it was funny because uh, I'm there. I'm like, hey, man, Slash, hey, can I take a picture? Which, by the way, it's probably on, on one of those um, yeah, 35 Nokia's. millimeter. And, and oh. I wish I I wish I, I could find it. But anyways, he says, you know, he says, yeah, man, sure. And uh, I'm like, hey, man, thanks, big fan. And, and uh, he asked me where I grew up, and I said, uh, hey, man, right across the border in Tijuana. And then he's, he's like, whoa, that must have been wild. I'm like, and I was like, yeah, man, it's cool. It was a good time. But I'm thinking like, wow, bro, you, yeah. you're freaking, freaking well, slash. You got to remember, dude, um, especially right now, mm-hmm. that's the da- most dangerous city in the world, supposedly. <laughs> that's what there's, if you look at the stats. Yeah, yeah. And to someone like Slash, even though he's the party rock and roll guy, he's from America. There's yeah. this stigma about Tijuana. <laughs> I don't care who you are. <laughs> you automatically think, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going down there, man. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, man. I always tell people it's, it's, it's a great place. And uh, I loved it. I wouldn't change a minute of uh, my childhood. But it's like anything. I said, bro, if you go down there, just, you know, just do the right thing. Be cool and, and have a good time. And that's cool. But if you're going to be uh, doing knucklehead things, then, yeah. uh, you know. Or if just by chance. Bad luck, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. But that's but, anywhere. But I was gonna just say that it could be New York, that could be LA, any big city. And unfortunately, Tijuana has changed a lot over the last 20 years because of the whole immigration and because it's it's basically the last stop, right? So Tijuana is not the Tijuana that I grew up in because all these people from all over the country and the world. There's Haitians right now and all these people. Yeah. But at the end of the day, man, it's uh, I still love it. I still yeah. uh, take friends down there. I mean, I still have a bunch of friends and family. That's where my dad's from. Really? Well, Tecate and Tijuana. Oh, nice. Um, but he left home and was a kid of the streets in Tijuana for a long time. Really? Yeah. And then he got over here and was in Logan. Wow. Yeah. Now, Logan, bro, talk about a rough uh, place to live and I grow grew up. up there. Yeah. No, I grew up there until I was about 10. Uh, with my grandparents, my mom. It is not the low people. I mean, because of real estate and everything mm-hmm. and development, and it's good now. And I'm I'm glad because th- there's a lot of money that's been pumped into it. And and uh, you know, you you talk about the economics and people, but at the same time, it's 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 a lot better place and safer place. Because back in the day, bro, you couldn't oh, yeah. walk down there at night. <laughs> it was it was bad. And you know, when you live there, you don't know no better. Right. We were going to the liquor store, playing mm-hmm. video games, yeah. running back mm-hmm. to the house not a big deal right but you'd hear it yeah cops everything um, Damn, man. i grew up right next door to corona furniture where's that furniture what's next what's next to that it's uh 29th right before you head over to sherman you go down the hill and past the freeway yeah it's and then if you go south the base is over there all right okay. right but okay. national avenue and there's a corona furniture right on the corner dude and there's a liquor store on that side if you go down this way there's another liquor store I, right now, my grandfather started a taco shop, and we lived behind it. Wow. Yeah, and so we would play. Your grandfather, the, uh, the, the, mariachi. the mariachi. And then we would play in the alley and then throw the baseball or whatever, tennis ball, up against the wall at Corona Furniture. That's a classic for Mexicans. We go against yeah, the wall and Yeah, you know, but we would always pretend to be like 
Fernando freaking Venezuela. Tony Gwynn. Oh, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like pitching, they, wind, they wind up. You're know, doing the wind up and you're throwing a little, we had a little square. Yes, you <laughs> paint it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, man. I mean, I grew up there and we. I went to Burbank Elementary and we would, they would walk us over to Chicano Park once or twice a week and we would have like fun playing on the, all the stuff and then right. they would walk us back over the little bridge and then back down Logan right there. Yeah, man, Logan still to this day is a great place. It's changed dramatically. It's well, it's I love it because I still go there, and and the change is like Porky Land's now Salud Tacos. Exactly. Yeah, like oh, oh Porky Land back back in the day, bro, carnitas burritas. Yeah, oh, dude. You get a couple pounds of carnitas. But oh, that whole man. street is like hipsterville. It now. is it's freaking yeah, awesome. It is. I like it. Yeah, it's you it, know? it is the Italian <laughs> restaurant that blew. Have you been there? A little Italian restaurant that's no. there. It's across from Barrio Dog. It's phenomenal. Really? Yeah. It's a little hole in the wall. It's a Italian couple that started it about a year and a half ago. Highly recommend. Oh wow! I'm gonna yeah. have to check it out yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Hey man, we're, uh, it's funny because we we're uh, very good friends with uh, Amigos Car Club. Okay. And uh, and uh, we actually had them on the show, and and it's funny because like they're they're old school, right? They're yeah. not like uh, these new kind of hipsters. Oh yeah, I got a low rider. I got yeah. forty thousand dollars. I'm gonna put a car together, put yeah. it on a car show. They're the real deal. They got their cars. They they drive them, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, when they were doing something down there, and uh, Rigo, one of the main dudes, uh, there was these people, and they were walking their little dog, and, uh, and he's like, that wouldn't happen 20 years ago. Never. <laughs> Never. No, you're right, Never. dude. My dad told me some pretty horrific stories that happened dude. in Chicano Park. You yeah. know, like down, down the street. Yeah. Seeing people get killed right in front of him, you know. I'm not, yeah. not trying to glorify that, but it was bad, dude. It was. It was no, no. That means that it is what it well, is. It was really well, bad. Well, dude, Shelltown was down to the east and then you had Sherman and then even going to Burbank being from Logan as a kid dude I was seven eight kids from Sherman would come around <laughs> talking shit right yeah. throwing the ass up and yeah. throwing rocks at us <laughs> and then we would all be like screw that and we'd pick up rocks Logan <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it started yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and dude I never forget that stuff dude I'm like uh-huh. wow and it's funny because only native San Diegans and Raza that understand the culture and the way that the the city is laid out know that stuff. Right. When I tell people, no, nah, I grew up in a neighborhood called Logan Heights, and then I, my mom, <laughs> bless her soul, she was like, we're going to get us out of here. We're moving to um, National City. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, was going to say it just <laughs> as a punch, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, <laughs> dis- no disrespect, oh, but I'm no. just saying, you know, but, you know, know how it is. <laughs> but then we are in Chula Vista, National City, Chula Vista, and right. then I've just been a kid from basically true of us to down to logan my my counterparts in the band sunny and Wub, are from like montgomery area okay and cedro and stuff so right like, they were like dude you're not really from south town i go i'm from south town I'm big, <laughs> anything from downtown south is south town. <laughs> and there's a stigma yeah all the people like when we would play shows at for soma glenn the owner at the time i don't know if he still owns it <clears throat> he was like i want to get the local this is when the local scene was booming there was two three thousand people coming just to see local bands but you also had P.O.D. representing South, Blink-182 representing the North, Switchfoot representing the North, Sprung Monkey was representing Sprung East County. Monkey. Yeah, so if you think about it, he was putting these shows together purposely to attract those parts of town. Mm-hmm. And, oh, man, we'd be bringing the neighborhood out, dude. <laughs> they don't know how to mash or nothing. They're throwing, they're throwing putazos fighting. Dude. <laughs> and we'd have to stop our show and be like, dude. That's, dude, that's, that was that's mashing, not, bro. It's, it's just... mashing. You can't can't be punching people, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, no. <laughs> dude, that's why they don't take us out. We don't know how to behave, bro. You know, because we came from the whole, all our friends were in a, a couple of our friends were in a, in a rap group called Legion of Doom. I remember them from, from Down Cedro. They were like a rap group. You know, and then there was Aztec Tribe, National City. Like there was a lot of that, dude. And we were the rock band. Yeah, from down there. <laughs> and to this day, we always like, dude. There's not been a really lower definition kind of did it, but p- the way we did it from South Bay, that's where a lot of people were like down there, like, dude, you guys freaking came out of South Town, South South. Bay, Which though. is, dude, you know? I was I think about that all the time because it, there's something to be said for that. Like imagine like when you were. Over there in Europe with corn. I mean, you're at the end of the day, you're from you know South San Diego. Yeah. And you're putting San Diego, San Diego, and South San Diego on the, on the map. And we still do it. We we rep it worldwide, man. And people buy San Diego. They were buying Chargers gear, Padres gear, the SD hats, and we'll show up to South America. We'll show up to places in Europe, and we're like, dude, are you from San Diego? No, no, I'm just a fan. And 
I like the hat, and I, I buy the hat because you guys wear it. And we're like, what the heck? Yeah. Crazy. We'll be signing them and everything. Same with the tribal <laughs> stuff. And right. We're like, that's all SD. Yeah, man. It's a trip, man. But it, yeah, that must feel good, right? We're all, we joke around and say, man, we need to get some commissions on <laughs> <laughs> That was the first part of our interview with POD's guitarist, Marcos Curiel. You can follow him at official Marcos Curiel to find out what's going on with him and POD. Please subscribe to our channel, download our podcast, check out our Facebook page, and follow us on Instagram at The Other Side Presents. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Until next time, we'll see you on the other side.